most people in life are looking for how do I make a living and how do I make retirement? And they're really concerned with a lot of things in the day-to-day -day aspects of living. They're also concerned with the law and how to make sure that what they're doing is within the realm of the law. You see, the problem in America is not that we don't understand there are laws. The problem is that people no longer regard the laws and they think they're above the law. Let's face it, many people are in a hurry today and if they get out of their house late on their time management plan, they end up speeding. That is a violation of the law. But they also know that if they're careful and if they're really thoughtful and if they're really watching, they might get away with speeding. Anymore, I don't bother doing that because A, I don't have a car anymore, and B, I just don't have the, the rush of mind to go places anymore. I get there when I get there on the Lord's timing. When I talk about God, people often will say, well, he's always talking about God, so there must be a real mental illness problem, and the answer is no. I simply love the Lord, and I love the land, and there's a difference. In life, we have moments of time to make a difference for someone, and if you're going to make a difference for someone, you do it in a regardful manner. I have to tell you a little lovely story about what happened to me yesterday. A little boy and his mom started walking by me as I was seated outside of a Target on their wonderful bench that they offer to the elderly and anybody who's fatigued who needs to sit down waiting for their pickup because sometimes people run errands and they drop one party of their family off or their friend and then they run off to do errands and they come back around and pick them up. At least this company that we know about, Target, seems to understand that. They have a couple benches and they're never full, at least when I'm there, and that's kind of a blessing. So I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, a mom and her son were walking by, and I thought they were just headed to the parking lot. And the little boy had on a t-shirt that said, do your best. And I thought, you know, what a wonderful thing to put on a kid, giving him the ideas of how he's supposed to be as he grows through into manhood. And I didn't expect anything else. I just complimented the little fellow on his shirt, and I said, that's a great little shirt, little man, and that's all I said. Well, within a few seconds, the mother actually approached me and said, this is for you. And I said, really? What, what is it? And she basically told me she had some things in a bag that she had purchased while she was in the shop that she felt that I needed. And I thought, wow, what a kindness. And I also understood that that mom was trying to teach her son about kindness and compassion and doing good things and passing it on and paying it forward. And like a lot of the things that we hear about that the rhetoric of the land of how do we make good, loving humanity happen in the world is we think about other people's lives. We wonder what their life is like. We wonder if we can do anything to cheer them up or to provide them some sort of sustenance. And that's basically what that mom was trying to show her son. I, of course, accepted the bag graciously, even though it was awkward for me. I did ask her what she was thinking about when she did that, because I'm always curious why people think that they should do things like that and what prompts them to do things like that. I want to make sure no one's trying to monkey with me. So I want to know that I'm, what I'm being given is really done in a true conscientious belief of life is important for all people and we should make sure everyone has provided for. And that's usually what I'm looking for when I'm ans asking that question. I also like to ask if the person is a member of a church because sometimes churches reach out and do community outreach by just talking about it in their congregations that if they see this, that they want to encourage people to do this because it's God's will to take care of all people, especially homelessness and other aspects of life that are troubling to people. Now, when I talk about this, I'm talking about this in a thoughtful way. This woman spent some money on me. She spent probably about 10 bucks of her own hard-earned discretionary income on my life. And I'm most humbled by that. The reality is that when I eventually looked in the bag, I saw that there was a couple things in there that I can't literally have. It's partly, partially my own diet and my own kind of sensitive stomach needs, but also because of what I've learned about how I've been sort of programmed in a way to be unfit in some regards in the reality that if I drink water alone, I sort of have a problem. And that's just something maybe I'm getting an allergy to what's going on and what toxins are being put in our water to keep it clean. I can't say for sure. So in a moment of time, the Lord said, you know, you can't really eat those things. You really can't re-gift them. It's not polite. Why don't you just walk into Target as you always do and you plan to do and talk to the customer service rep and see what she can do for you. So I literally did. I went in and I said, look, there's a couple things here that I can't actually receive and I don't know what to do about it. So what should we do? And she said, well, let's just return these things basically and you can go get what you need. And that's precisely what I did. It allowed me to pick up what I needed right then. And then I was able to go back later in the evening when I wanted a little bit more food and buy a little bit more. And then this morning I was able to produce for myself a little bit better breakfast and lunch, if you will, based on the small amount that I had left. 
It was a wonderful thing. I did eat one of the items she brought me, which was jerky, because I do love jerky, but it is incredibly expensive. It's not true, but it is overpriced sometimes in certain places, and I'll just leave it at that. The reality is that I have the right to render opinion on that, but it was still a kind gift, and I felt good in taking it and receiving it from her. Now, the reason that I'm talking about the story is not to expect anyone else to do those sort of things, but it was just to show that some parents are really teaching their kids about caring for others. It is something that the politicians of the land are sort of talking about. They're saying, hey, we have a responsibility to these issues of old, and we have a responsibility to people right now to help them to go further in life. You see, America is about the land of prosperity to a lot of people who are coming here, flocking here, really looking for asylum because they're not finding a life in their home country. Their home countries are ridden with plague, if you will, a kind of love of drugs and lording over other people's lives and guns and roughness and things that most human beings don't really want to associate their lives or their children with. Now we have a real issue at the borders because someone thought they should separate parents from children. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure I totally agree with that because a child is an impressionable soul and needs the protection of a parent from predators and other children who've not learned to mind themselves or to mind their hands or to mind their mouths in regard to other souls. Now, when I talk about this, I'm not making any comments about anything that's gone on because I haven't seen the news completely to know what exactly happened. I know that someone stepped down and maybe that was the appropriate thing and maybe she was in a state of being manipulated to what she was supposed to do. And she didn't feel good about it later in her soul, she, so she chose to align herself with the right, and meaning she just decided, I'm going to step away from this now. Or maybe it's time for someone else to come in because that's a heated topic for people. A lot of people don't like what's going on at the borders because of several reasons. One, they don't want to lose job opportunities to people who really don't care about the land. They don't want to lose job opportunities to people who will come here and do more illegal activity because the premise for which they came to America was based on illegal thought. That if I just walk over the border, I'll be safe and sound in America, and none of the laws will impact me. That's not really true. Our laws and our treaties say that they have to have a legitimate reason for coming in. It's only our famous people, our actors, our athletes, and people of great minds and great wealth that get to kind of travel around the world without any worry about needing asylum, and they literally are allowed into countries for longer periods of time because of their gifts. We have plenty of British actors who come over here and produce a life and stay here long term because they're considered cultural assets now to our land as much as they are to their own homelands. And that's okay. But for the average person, for the low-income wage earner, or earner, it's sort of tough to give up our jobs to foreigners who might not follow all the laws that they're being taught because maybe the Hispanic person or the Spanish speaker that's doing the training is not really giving them the full meal deal about what the laws are regarding the tainting of food, the selecting of people's items out of their pockets and other things, and that's really a problem. You see, someone who's willing to come here illegally might be open and willing to do other illegal activities to stay here, to remain here, to do things to harm other people's lives or their rights. That's the concern that I have when we talk about the borders. Now, I had a family friend who came over here totally, completely legally. That family friend became a part of my family. Her family friends also became a part of a family. We used to have international Thanksgiving dinners with lots of people who were here on lawful visas, but they weren't legitimate Americans. We would literally have food from Japan and food from America at that Thanksgiving to make sure everybody's palates was satisfied. You see, the moral of the story is not, did that woman do the right thing and try to provide me something? It's not that she did the wrong thing, but she took away my right of choice. You see, the right of choice is to say, I know what my body needs, and what my body needed in that moment was not those items. At the same time, I couldn't eat certain food items because of sensitivities I had, and so the money could have been placed a little bit differently. If she had just purchased a gift card, then it would have been my choice to go in when it was on my timing of my food needs to select what I needed for food or anything else I might have needed, like something to take care of this little uh, big toe problem that I seem to be having or openly to handle some of the flesh wounds I get from the fact that I can't wear socks when it's so bloody cold outside, and I'm learning how people can stay warmer by not having socks on, because some cotton actually retains the cold instead of developing the heat. Not everyone knows these tips, and I'm learning how to be homeless in a way that might provide educational value to people who might be facing poverty, who might not have heat in their houses, who are trying to figure out how to stay warm in the night. We have a lot of people in the land who are not thinking about their futures, we have a lot of people living in the here and now only. If I have this job right now, I'll be fine. Later in life, they don't think about where that job is going to lead them, how long they should stay there, 
where they should be looking for networking and how to get out of impoverished moments of time. I had a lovely chat with a gal that I've met a couple times now at a local dinner that they provide to people in loving kindness with regard to their options in their church, that they feed people who are having disability issues, they feed the elderly who may not have the rights or the ability to cook anymore, and they feed people who might only get one meal a week. Now think about that. I hope that's not anyone's case. I've been very fortunate that every time the Lord said, we're going to provide you something for breakfast, I'm absolutely flabbergasted that that actually happened to me today. It didn't happen on the timing that I thought it was based on when I was gifted that prophetically in my mind, but it definitely, totally, completely happened that now I don't have to worry about meals for a couple days because of the kindness of a total stranger. Someone who is of faith, no church, and that's something fascinating to me, that there are many people of faith in the land, but they don't have a religious affiliation with any organization, probably for a lot of reasons. One, time management. Sunday's a holiday for a lot of people who work full-time. If you're a stay-at-home mom, you've got every day as a holiday, right? Until something happens to your spouse, and then where are you going to go? You've got no connections, no affiliations, no professional network, and no opportunity to jump into a career that you left when you went to become a mom or a dad. So we have to look at that. We have to look at how to produce incomes for families in a way that makes sense for the long term. We can't just presume that real child rearing is all we're going to do in life. We might have to keep a side gig going while we're rearing that child. We're teaching our children to earn for sure. We're teaching our children to mind when it's time to be quiet because we're on the professional phone. We're teaching our children language because they're listening to us talk on the phone. They're learning how to speak on the phone by listening to their parents. Children do listen even though they might be playing. They're hearing how to talk to people, how to greet people, how to meet people, and you're encouraging them to talk to strangers only when you're around. You're also teaching them how to interact with strangers, and that's something really important. Now, when I talk about these things, I'm sort of along the lines of a pro pro professional person who is vying for the candidacy of the presidency. What I'm so impressed about this woman is that she's getting where people are investing their time, that people invest their time mainly in school and in family. She also knows that the laws are what protect us from the vultures of the land who think they have the right to rob us of our property, our personhood, and our paperwork. There are many people whose rights are being violated underneath international human rights law. It's something that as a nation we've sort of forgotten about, that we are a part of these international treaties and that we openly are responsible for paying attention to whether or not our behavior and actions are violating someone else's human rights. That is something that a presidential candidate like Kamala Harris, can help us to grasp. There are other candidates that have other issues, that have other divinations, that have other skill sets, that have other talents, that can remind us of those things in their souls. And then we can decide who is best for us, best for the land, in terms of whether or not we think we need to protect ourselves from the people who are lying, stealing, and cheating us out of our homes and out of our rights. You see, I don't have an oppos opposition to immigration, and Trump has said it very well, President Trump, that is, I should honor his position, has said it extremely well, that the policies are outlandish. They don't function anymore for families at all. We have families who've been here for years who were married and were never allowed to live together in America, so you got one parent living in Canada, another living in America. That's ridiculousness. We have to fix some of that. We have to allow love to lead us in a lot of ways. And that's something other candidates, like Marianne Williamson, can help us to understand. She has an incredible spirituality knowledge, a savant, if you will, I'd like to say, and frankly, she has some interesting ideas. She's also still working on her campaign platform, so don't write her off completely. What I see and the other people who are out there is not a lot more than anything else. But it is time for a female president in the land, not one that's going to only focus on girls and female issues, one that recognizes that men have concerns too, that we are just as concerned about the safety as women, if we're a good person underneath the house of the Lord, we are concerned with this. At the same time, we recognize that we don't have the right to lord over any woman about her body, her decisions, or anything in her life. You see, the feminist movement really helped us to get there, but we're still sort of struggling in that realm. That men do make a slightly higher wage is probably true. Where we get that data, I don't really know, but we have to figure out how to make sure that we're leveling the playing field, not only for the folks who are in education, but also for the various jobs across the land that really produces a life. We are topsy-turvy and upside down, if you will, on what produces us a life. There's only one field that produces us for a life. Do you know what that field is? 
or are you still so silly, ridiculous in your ideas about politics that you don't recognize that the only way you continue living is by having food on your table? Kamala Harris has started to talk about this in a legitimate way. She's recognizing that we must eat to live. We must eat healthily to live long and prosper, if you will, to quote Spock from Star Trek, but we also must eat to survive. And when we have people coming in from foreign countries trying to ruin our food, taint our food, make us fall asleep, take our possessions and property off of us, like I'm pretty sure happened to me in one of two places the other day where they stole one of my favorite family shirts. I actually had two of them originally, but one went missing when I was in an apartment complex. One was my spouse's and one was mine. That shirt had a little squirrel on it talking about how the family drives me nuts. That shirt's gone missing from my bag. Or it was in my pack that was my sleeping gear that someone's pilfered off me after they offered me a ride. You see, we have these ideas in our mind that if I do something for someone, then I can take what I want. That's not the way the land works here. You don't have the right to put your hands on any human being at all. Even to touch their back, even to rub their shoulder, you have to ask permission. That is the HR law of the land. We have to get back to what is regardful of people's rights with regard to their own boundaries, their own physical boundaries, but their own psycho-emotional boundaries. You might be a real touchy-feely person, but you still have to say something like, I love when women are in my spirituality classes, ask me, may I hug you? They know I'm sensitive about that. They know if I say no, it doesn't mean that I don't like them, it just means that I'm not in that hugging moment right now. And they get that. And yet, there's always somebody who wants to push the envelope. I remember going to a group that was talking about loss long ago at the Hermitage in Indianapolis, a wonderful facility for all kinds of small group activities or weddings or other things. They don't have a lot of parking, so that's their challenge. But it's a great place to be spiritually. But openly, I was in a group of meditation folks or conversation of some kind, and I mentioned that I didn't like the fact that people thought they could just come up and put their hands on me and hug me. And yet, I still had one woman at the end of the class who came up, total stranger, and hugged me. There was no reason for the hug. I wasn't crying. I wasn't emotional. I wasn't feeling the room. I wasn't doing anything like that that would open the door to say it's an appropriate social gesture or social nuance for you to offer a hug or even demand a hug or even give one without my permission. See, men are like this sometimes. Then there are other men that are like, sure, anybody wants to touch me, it's fine. Well, that's great for you, but it's not great for everyone. You see, everyone has a privacy moment of time where they have private thoughts, private ideas, private things they want to do with other people, if you get one of my meaning on that, and that is their private right. I don't get how there are certain topics that are becoming political agendas for right-wing people. They're not your agenda. Your private bedroom is yours. My private bedroom is mine. My private parts are mine, and your private parts are yours. This is not a nudist colony here in America. You want to go to one of those by all means, have at it. You have the right to go choose that for you, your spouse, your loved one, whoever, your children. I don't know how that works exactly when there's kids around, but that's not my point. Go to California, go to wherever those places are, but don't think you've got a right to voyeur on my body, take photographs of me lawfully, illegally, and unsolicited without my consent or position just because you were held a gun. Now, gun laws are definitely something we've got to look at. For the longest time, we've not really educated people about guns very well. We've not ch taught children how to protect the land with them. We've not taught people how to protect themselves from wild beasts with them. We've got actors who walk into the forest thinking, I'll be just fine, and you just want to go, are you out of your mind? That is a wild beast. At any second, they could turn in their mindset, in their emotions, and you'll be dead because they can rip your arms off or eat you. But that's just me. We sort of got that feeling in a great old film with Robert Redford and Meryl Streep about out of Africa where literally he had to shoot something because it was charging. And we have to get back to understanding and recognizing that these reptile lovers are ruining our lands because people get them and then they can't handle them anymore and so they release them into the wild. That changes our habitat, that changes our opportunities for food, it changes a lot of things. It changes the aspects of the birds in the air and the beasts on the land. You see, the Lord gave us rights over all those things, but he didn't give us the right to lord over other people. Slavery was something that went on in the Bible times, but we are long from gone from those days. We all recognize that every color under the face of the sun is developed by God, and openly we all have equal rights underneath the international human rights law of the world's nations, the superpowers and the little guys. We have to get back to understanding what human rights are in America. So many people are littering in the streets. I literally walked to the library today, watched a fancy old red 4x4 drive by me, 
The woman was smoking, which made me kind of annoyed. But I don't like it when women smoke. I just think it's an ugly habit. But my spouse smoked, and I would tease her about it. And eventually, she quit cold turkey. It was a rough week, boy, when she did that. Really rough on me. Really rough. But I won't go there. I was proud of her for doing it because it was good for her health. Now, my point is, it wasn't the fact that she made the choice of hurting herself and her body and her lungs, which we all learned in seventh grade health class, that happens when you smoke. It was that she threw her butt in the street. I was offended. I believe that's littering. I believe there's a fine for that, at least 50 bucks. And openly, I was sitting there going, we're right near the police department. Where are the police officers to tow her out of her car and tell her that America is not her litter box? Now, we all know that trash blows all around America. There's two reasons for it. One, we don't have enough trash cans publicly put out there by stores. Two, we don't have the motto like they do overseas in Japan that says, you bring trash with you, you take it home with you. You put it in your own trash receptacle. We have a lot of people who just throw stuff down. I've only done that once or twice in my life because I literally couldn't carry it all. And I have felt guilty about it ever since. But I'm not admitting that completely. I'm just saying people do lose things. The other day I lost a piece of paper out of my bag because the wind took it. And that's kind of what I mean, is that I didn't have the energy to go chase it down the street and no one thought who was walking ahead of me to stop the thing or to stop their car and grab it for me. It could have been the stupidest piece of paper in the world. It could have been my secret love notes to the one I love. It could have been anything. I don't know what it was because it blew out of my bag. But openly, that's the point, that trash does blow around. Keep America Clean used to be a motto on television. Reach out and touch someone was a great kind of concept of telephoning people and checking in with people. But today, we don't have enough landlines is absolute truth. Today, we don't have enough pocketed minutes is also true. And we're getting lied to by our technology companies of what we have the right to do and not do with our free concepts. I went to produce something on a different channel that I loved a long time, but I don't use a great deal and discovered that now they want money per month to just do one little thing. And I thought, okay, that's reasonable because they probably have grown and they have more expenses and more capital expenses and more people to pay in salary, etc. But I need to know, where's the boundary? How much do I get for free and how do I tell what is going to work in that free amount of space? Now, when I'm talking about these things, I'm talking about real life because every human being does need to be technologically online to some degree because our employment is connected to online activities. The capital investments we produce in our life to purchase computers are our rights. They're not some technology company's rights to give away to other software programs to allow them to voyeur in on our life through gaming and other ways. I don't want games on my computer. I'd like to be able to delete them. When I go to delete them, they won't delete. There are other programs on my computer and my laptop I didn't want there, but I couldn't delete them to free up the space. I find that offensive. If I'm buying a laptop, I want to know that even if you're going to make that strategic alliance, that you're going to offer the software to someone, that they have the right to delete it without having to go to some monstrous place, pay a monstrous fee to get it officially deleted. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make all the difference in the world for people. You're probably hearing sounds out there because I don't like being shut in a room where there's no air moving. And as you see, the lights are going off. It's always happening. And it's only started happening since certain people started to pay attention to what I was doing. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make a real difference for someone. The lady today who gifted me something so that I could have a real breakfast simply heard the Lord say, you need to do this. He might need something. And it was such a blessing. I was taken back. I was in awe of the fact that the Lord said, we're going to make sure you have a good breakfast today. And I will go have that breakfast. I will literally have breakfast in the middle of the day somewhere, somehow, I will. But when God talks to you like that, you've got to be willing to listen. There's some amazing people in a lot of different industries who need to start reaching out and helping the world to become a better place. They do it not only in their minds, but they do it in their everyday life. And that's what I guess what I'm promoting, is that if we're going to have politicians in the land, they need to be focused on the here and now. The only thing that keeps our life going forward is one thing, folks. It's food and basically water. These land masses, these waterways, these rivers must be protected by law enforcement who like living outdoors, who like riding horses, who like riding ATVs, who can get where they need to go, who know how to survive in difficult situations of inclement weather. And we've got to have gear that's not produced all from foreign countries that is crap. I purchased several pieces of gear and eventually I just had to give away my best suit that I had literally had for 20 years because of the fact I lost so much weight. It was falling down. I was getting trapped in my rain suit. So I have another one and I got that it wasn't quite at the same quality and I gave my pants bottoms away because they kept falling down. 
Now, I've had that happen to me when I was sitting at a place where my pants fell down, but, you know, thankfully I had another pair of pants on underneath it. So we have to talk for propriety a little bit more with people. That we've got people going out in the freezing cold without a jacket. And like, if that car breaks down, what are you going to do then? You got a blanket in the car? Do you have flares to get help? Will anyone pull over who's not trying to harm you? You see, we have to produce America as a loving place again. We have to get back to life is about love, liberty, happiness, pursuit of American dreams in terms of financial success. Why? Because we're all going to age and retire. And we have to learn how to protect our health. It's why my mother produces her life with a little help of a product that she has. It literally has gotten her through four bouts of cancer. It didn't necessarily cure the cancer, but it might have cured other parts of her being that were infiltrating that aspect of her life. Think of that. Four-time survivor. Amazing. But in reality, there are other people who survived too, thankfully. And there are other people we've lost, unfortunately. But the God in the heaven called them home. It was their time, either for them, for their family, for their education, or whatever reason, God calls us home. Now, in life, we have moments of time to produce someone. We can either produce them as a monster through lying and deceit and theft, or we can produce them as who they are, truly in their souls. We have to get back for understanding that the soul is what is gifted to a family. We have so many parents who think they made something. Well, maybe they did because they got busy with someone else. But we also have people who don't recognize the soul of all human beings. They allude that a person is in league with Lucifer, or they say the person is evil, or they do this. That is not true. That is not their lawful right underneath the biblical context or any Dead Sea Scroll or any other work probably around the land that came from God that talks about God loves all people, and we need to get back to loving all people in America. The political climate is ripe for a change. President Trump definitely did a great job in a lot of ways, making people think more about business with his marketing of himself to the presidency with his show The Apprentice. He also did a good job making sure people knew who he was when it came time for the election. But in life, you have to let people know who you are in your soul. If you're running for president, I encourage you to start showing yourself of who you really are. Don't tackle issues that you're not comfortable with because you look uncomfortable in the photographs. There's one photograph I'm going to crap all over in a few minutes, but not with you, with the people who did it, because I think it was outlandish. But that's just my opinion as an old man. Now, in life, we have moments of time to give our feedback. And here's something I've learned in marketing, that when you ask for a survey from people of whether or not they like the service or if they felt that anything could be improved, do not give that survey information directly by sending it immediately to the local folks. If you're a national or international firm, you bring that data into your data house. You take that data in and you collect it. You give it a few days before you send it over and you don't align a survey by numbers with a person's purchase. That's not fair to that individual because eventually the people in the local community will figure out who that individual is who gave the commentary good, bad, or indifferent, and they will start to retaliate. I've had that happen to me multiple times in multiple agencies, and it literally could put the entire company at a lawsuit. Not only is the person's privacy and right to privacy taken away, who gave the time, who took the time to fill out that survey of yours, but it also takes away their right to not be bothered by the fact that they run an opinion on one moment in time of their experience. The next moment in time might be different. You see, in life, we have moments of time to make all the difference in the world for people. And if you're not living your life for people, what are you living it for? We don't live for animals. We tame them in the wild. We domesticate them for our own food production, and we have to protect those houses. They shouldn't be left unattended by any means. There should literally be a shotgun armed man protecting our pig houses, our cow pastures, everything. That is what we must do to protect our lives as American citizens. And I'm not putting this out there so that the fanatics of the weirdo world go out there and start ruining our food. We already have that happening with the influx of certain groups starting to purchase up gas stations, infiltrating how much quality gas we get, and purchasing up restaurant chains that are allowing them to do that. But when you go in there, you have to be really cautious. Because if you say the wrong thing, they might just taint your food. Why? Because they do that in their foreign land. There's no laws against it, allegedly, or they just do it anyway. So we have to really look out for ourselves today. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make a person's life better or make it worse. You have to decide what kind of individual you're going to be is absolute truth. The president of tomorrow is one who's going to honor all people at all times 
in all situations. That's a tough act to follow. It's a tough act to put in place because we all have emotions and ideas about certain situations. But the bottom line is human rights, international human rights law, defines where our personhood, paperwork, and property begin and end. And that's how we stop the thieves of the world from destroying lives and killing people shamelessly. Thanks for listening.